Hey everybody, welcome to the Coin Geek Weekly Live Stream. I am your host. Oh, that didn't come through very well. Uh, Mr. Kurt Walker Jr., uh, live from exile uh, for the sake of my my sanity and safety. Uh, we're we're rocking and rolling here. It is Tuesday at two. So if you are watching, please like, subscribe, hit the alert bell so you know every time we go live here on the YouTube channel. And share across social media. Let them know that we are taking questions from the troll box. Today is, um, well, it's the normal time, but it's something of a special show because we're, we're discussing a specific topic. We got two guests from the Bitcoin Association. We're going to be discussing uh, kind of the history of, of what it looks like to uh, blacklist, freeze, move. What, what is the role of honest nodes? We're going to have a, a, a much deeper philosophical conversation than we would typically have on this show. And, uh, and we're going to try to break things down so that you understand. We will also segregate out questions till the end of the show, but I'm going to be, I'm going to try to be the question man. And, uh, we're going to bring in Marcin and Jod to be the answer men because, uh, they're going to, you know, take it from sort of a, a legal philosophical and a technical standpoint about, uh, what is possible in Bitcoin and not specifically just BSV, but also Bitcoin, uh, generally, like what is possible with the Bitcoin protocol? What, what are the what are the demands on an honest node? Uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, the nature of, you know, man and law and and a, and a whole bunch of things. So uh, this one may even go long. Uh, I, I could see possibly happening. So uh, if, if you guys want to let me know in the private chat uh, here as the guests, like, can you go long? If we need to go long, just just let me know ahead of time. So uh, everybody, we uh, we're going to cover all this stuff and we're going to answer your questions. My hope is that this will be uh, well, not not written. I'm sure there's going to be written documentation, but I would really like this to be the definitive Q and A about uh, about things to come. So, uh, I believe we have an ad. So, Mr. Moon will play the ad. We'll be back with Jad Wahab and Marcin Zarkovsky. Bitcoin SV is is generating like an insane number of transactions. No, that, that that's from artificially created demand. It it may well be that a lot of the people using Bitcoin SV today are doing it, you know, as, as a proof of concept. But nevertheless, they are doing it on a public system that we can all verify and watch. And, you know, whether or not that the demand is artificial um, doesn't take away anything from the proof of concept that it's technically possible to do this. everybody <laughs> how, how are you guys doing it's all good thank you, good. There you go. <laughs> lot, i don't know if you're of, talking to the audience or a lot of excitement <laughs> guys this is good <laughs> all right let's let's get right into it because I, I think we have a lot of ground to cover um can we break down in a very basic sense like what what exactly has has changed from you know just in the last couple of months here uh, I know there's been a little bit of a journey. There's been a lot of discussion about the right way to implement things uh, and maybe even the history. So maybe we should start just a bit with the history of uh, honest nodes and their interaction with the network. Um, Jod, uh, I'll start with you because this is uh, a, more of a technical question, but in in Bitcoin script, uh, 2009 era, there there is what was called the, the op true bug or the one return bug, uh, depending who you ask. And essentially, it allowed honest nodes or any node and any node to act honestly or dishonestly and reassign a UTXO just just by doing it. Can you explain that process uh, and and maybe let us know, uh, in your opinion, um, you know, why some people think of it as a bug and other people might think of it as, well, this is, you know, maybe obviously not a bug. So I, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that as a as a preface, please. I mean, that's, uh, that's more of a philosophical thing, you know, just uh, <laughs> for, for people to like reminisce, I think in, in, the, in the broader sense, it doesn't really make much of a difference. Um, at the end of the day, it's, um, you know, uh, the, the, the system lends itself to, you know, miners needing to become big uh, entities uh, that are, you know, corporate entities. So there's no way that they can and investing so much uh, energy and, and resources. So there's no way that they can be this like uh, you know anonymous 
uh, entity that's just floating around and uh, stealing coins or doing anything, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, obviously wrong and, and illegal. Um, so, you know, at the end of the day, in, in the beginning, when that was the case, when the system was just being bootstrapped and mm -hmm. people were just running the systems on their on their laptops, obviously that uh, opened the system to uh, vulnerability. But now, when the system has been a lot more mature, um, it's not like anyone could do that and get away with it. So that's kind of uh, in, a, in a nutshell. Sure. Um, you know, and, and I, I think that really covers it in a, in a basic sense that when something is immature, you know, and, you know, there were a dozen nodes on the network and the difficulty was, you know, one <laughs> across the network. Like, the Same as the block size, right? It, well, right. You know, like th these kind of things. It's like, oh, okay, mo most blocks have no transactions in them. Like nobody actually cares. None of it's worth anything. Like this is a, you know, very early on is a is a science experiment in, hey, can we even bootstrap a peer-to-peer -peer money? Like, is that is it something that can be done? Because so far it's failed for 20 years. And so letting people sort of tinker with tools, you know, at that point, who cared if somebody robbed you of 10,000 Bitcoins, right? Like it didn't, it didn't mean basically anything. So... Um, and, and this is something that I've, I've kind of struggled with myself is if Bitcoin is or was or could become a store of value, at what point did it transition to being a store of value? I think that that's a, like a very unclear uh, delineation there, too, as to, you know, maturity in a network. But um, Marcin, I'll, I'll cut to you for my next uh, my next question. Can, can we clarify um, what what is the the digital asset recovery program uh, system like? What what does this look like from a, a legal standpoint? You as uh, I believe it's general counsel at Bitcoin Association. I think you have a couple other titles too. But um, if you could let us know, like what what do you see this tool as? How should it be used? Um, and maybe just give us an overview of of what exists now uh, with with this tool. I think I need to start with more of a fundamental issue here. Um, it's that how do you actually what how do you perceive Bitcoin? Uh, what it is? So if you if you perceive perceive it as a kind of a anarchistic anonymous network where you can send transactions and you can use it for n not necessarily always legal. Uh, uh, compliant things, uh, then you will understand whatever I'm going to say differently. Uh, however, like we do not believe that, uh, and this whole mantra that uh, not your keys, not your Bitcoin. We think otherwise. We 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 think that uh, Bitcoin is a, is a system. It's a ledger. It's a mean of storing data in very specific way. But there is nothing special in it itself that can put it outside of the applicable and existing you know, rules and regulations and um, more importantly, property law. So when you come, when you start from this kind of assumption and from this principle, it, it, the situation looks totally different. So the digital asset recovery tool is a, is a, a tool set, is a set of, of, of different software elements that in the first initial phase should uh, allow for freezing assets that were uh, when there is a valid court order. And we also we always make this also kind of caveat or a document of equivalent value. But uh, just to preemptively answer some of our probably uh, hostile uh, uh, hostile to us listeners, it's not necessarily that the Bitcoin Association is going to have a circular resolution that will just freeze someone's assets. It's just uh, that in some jurisdictions, there are other uh, authorities that are entitled to issues, document or uh, like orders uh, that can freeze their certain assets, like you know, public prosecutor and different jurisdictions. So that was more, more to address this concern, to have a very broad, very broad, but at the same time, um, brought in applicability in different jurisdictions term. So when there is a valid court order or document of equivalent value that uh, basically usually applies to assets that were stolen or access to, to which was lost. And uh, this within this due process, uh, a victim or, or someone that lost his access to his coins can can prove that uh, was an actual is an actual owner of these assets but cannot access them. 
So this set of tools uh, in the, the first phase, this, this set of uh, software tools is composed of actually three elements. Uh, first element is the SVNode software. Uh, so the software that is required by all the miners on BSV to, to participate in the network and to mine blocks um, in accordance with the uh, Nakamoto consensus. And actually in October or November last year in uh, the release version SV node 1.0.9, uh, there were certain features included in that, uh, in that release that allowed for blacklisting UTXOs by miners. But back then miners had to do it, since then miners had to do it like kind of manually, they were allowed to do so. The second element is actually the standalone software However, uh, it operates usually in, in conjunction with SVNode software called Blacklist Manager. And this is something that uh, was released, if I'm not mistaken, last week by Bitcoin Association. What this software does, it automates the process of putting the certain UTXOs on the, on the blacklist. But so again, miners that run SVNode software should run also Blacklist Manager. It is a standalone software, but uh, there are plans that with the once Terra nodes, Terra node gets released in the future, this blacklist element will be integrated into Terra node. But for 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 several reasons, and I'll, I'll probably uh, need to explain that later on, it was decided that it will still be separate from from SV node. And then there is a third element, software element, uh, which has not yet been released and it's not going to be released by Bitcoin Association because it's uh, it, the role of this third uh, software element is totally, let's say outside of Bitcoin Association's mandate is called, we call it very generally as notary tool. What this tool does, it should do when, once it's released, uh, it translates those valid court orders that I mentioned into machine readable format and then broadcasts them to blacklist managers run by miners. So what it does, it like automates the process and it allows miners to, when they establish trust with a party that operates the notary tool, to, 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 to not, not to bother so much with, you know, manually putting the, 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 the blacklisted coins into the blacklist manager and so on and so forth. So this is like all together, this, this, this can be called digital asset recovery tool set. And the other term that actually refers to the whole process of freezing the assets that can be done through all those elements can be called digital asset recovery process. What I've just described and what is possible at this stage with the software that has been released. So with the SVNode software since October last year and the newest version with the blacklist manager that was released um, last week and with the notary tool once it gets released and it's operated by a, by, by a third party, it's, what is possible is the freezing of the assets. However, in the future, and uh, it also shouldn't be a surprise to, to the broader public uh, because uh, it was also mentioned in the settlement agreement between TTL, uh, Totally Trading Limited and Bitcoin Association that is also functioning in public domain. A Bitcoin Association is also working on the second stage of the whole process. So when there is a valid court order, a party that has such court order or a documented equivalent value will be allowed to recover the assets that were stolen or, or, or access to which were, was lost. This is the second stage and uh, works over, over, over that software elements that can enable this are still ongoing and uh, will be definitely informing broader public when when we are able to release more information about that sounds good uh, give me one sec I'm, uh, <clears throat> uh so it, we got a get an extra got, got all kinds of people in the in the troll box today but uh um I'd, I'd like if we can if we can keep greg's comments in i, I don't want him to not be uh you know not not participate because I, I i think the thing that really matters here is is clarity and and explaining what is what. And there are parts of this that I personally, um, you know, I, I look at and say, mm, 
you know, is, is, is this an opportunity to just go, you know, get court orders from, you know, Cameroon and Benin and North Korea and, and, you know, and, and now we've got, you know, uh, my company, which is a, a U.S. based entity, I'm, I'm mining on BSV, but you know, I, I think that this, in theory, applies to BTC and BCH as well. But you know, my company, I've talked to my general counsel about it, and and the response has been, well, obviously, we're not going to honor a, a a court order from North Korea. But the question has been, well, do we honor a court order uh, from from a local jurisdiction? And so. And if not, you know, what, what does it look like when there is a, a, a major disagreement among, you know, let, let's say the UK says, yes, this is enforceable and it needs to be done within 60 days, but nobody can get me a, a valid court order. And TAL, which as I understand it is a Canadian corporation, uh, if they can't get one in jurisdiction. And so now we've got this, this convoluted mess that some people would say, well, that's, that's part of the sufficient decentralization and why we shouldn't worry about the protocol. But these are the edge cases that people are unclear on. And I think it's important to define whether or not they, you know, ha has this been looked into? Has this been discussed? Uh, Marcin, you're, you're an attorney yourself. Um, sure. Walk me through this, please. I, I Let's just say I get court orders from North Korea, UK, Cameroon. Like, wh what do I do as an American entity mining on the chain? I knew that I would be very often coming back to, to, to what I started with. It's just there is nothing special about Bitcoin that can put it outside of the you know applicable laws and, 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 and also property law. And I'll just move away a little bit from Bitcoin for a second to just show the analogy. Imagine that we are not talking about Bitcoin at all. Imagine that, I don't know, you have a, you, you've been visiting UK. I don't know how, but you took your car over there, or maybe you bought a car in the UK, and, and, and it got stolen in the UK. Okay, so what would you do? You, will, you would probably either go to police, or, or maybe you know who stole it, or you, someone borrowed this, this, like a friend from UK. We have some friends from the, from the UK. Um, someone borrowed a, a car from you and is not giving it back. And so what would you do? You would go to a UK court, and you would just seek a legal recourse. You would just, you know, provide sufficient evidence that this car was yours and that that person currently uh, possesses your car and uh, is not giving it back, you would probably get a court order with, you know, uh, with, with, with sufficient, uh, with applicable injunctions. Um, but what if that person somehow moves with, the, with this car? I don't know. Uh, let's give it to Norway. You know, also, not, we have also some friends in Norway. Is and some is the UK adversaries? <laughs> <laughs> Let's put it that way. Uh, what would you do with the UK court order? Is the UK court order automatically valid in the, in Norway? I doubt so. No, probably not. So uh, in every jurisdiction, at least maybe I'm overstating, but like in most jurisdiction, at least in developed countries, there are in civil law, civil procedural law, you have specified process for domestication and recognition of foreign judgments. So what you will do, you will go to probably, you know, Norwegian court, and there is a specific procedure where you just can come with your UK, like with the court order issued by the UK court, you just submit it and you request it to be domesticated. And there are, you know, the specific criteria that the Norwegian court would have to verify if there was a due process, if, if, if the other party was, rights were respected and so on and so forth. And probably, quicker than if you would initiate a whole new process in and a whole new case in Norway, you would get it, get it domesticated. With that Norwegian court order, you would go to uh, enforce, we will try to enforce it probably by local bailiffs. So they can yeah. seize the car from that, from, from that friend of yours. This is what you would do. And it works in, in most of the jurisdictions. Sam, like if you have a Canadian court order, it's not automatically valid. In US, you need to domesticate it. So this is the way it works. And now coming back to Bitcoin. And to what I said, I'm going to repeat it the third time. There's nothing that you know really puts Bitcoin outside of the existing legal uh, rules and, and, and laws and, and, and regulations. You would have to do the same. So the beauty of this whole concept is that the beauty, but maybe also a, a curse, is that you would still um, 
the plaintiff that has a court order and wants to enforce it through the whole digital asset recovery process has a court order issued in let's let's give this let's take this example from north, north, north korea so uh well no I don't, I don't think any miner that currently mines on bsv and that could potentially mine on bsv if we if, if it moves from btc or bch would respect the court order in uh, issued by the north korean court but if that plaintiff goes to um court in florida where i assume a courier pool is registered and then court in canada where tal is registered and then a court in japan when sbi crypto is registered and goes through all the through the whole process and is managed to have this court order recognized so the the, the court order is as valid as court order issued respectively in us in canada in japan then all these miners that I mentioned would have to, like, would not would have to, but they should abide, abide and respect this court order. Otherwise, they risk being in contempt. Mm -hmm. And I think this is a different story. So probably your legal counsel would say, well, it's a North Korean court order, but after it was domesticated and the U U.S. court verified if it was issued validly, if it's in accordance with the U.S. legal system and applicable laws, it's still valid. And we need okay. to respect it because otherwise we risk being in contempt of the court. Sure. Okay. I, I appreciate the the thorough response. Let's talk a little bit about what this looks like from a from a technical standpoint. Jod, are we are we talking about um, creating an invalid? Uh, well, there's a couple of things. I've I've heard a lot of people say like, well, are these going to be newly minted coins and the old coins are burned or you know whatever they're they're crushed with encryption they can't ever move again or is this some kind of a you know you create some kind of invalid transaction type or are we creating some kind of like inflationary event like let's say you move or you give someone a million coins is there then an extra million coins like what is the like what the heck are we talking about what does this look like in a practical sense um on the ledger on the network like what bitcoin rules are being utilized here maybe you can talk about what rules what scripts like walk us through what this looks like technically um yeah sure so in terms of um from a from a technical standpoint obviously there's no uh there's no inflation there's no creation of new coins that's probably more of a legal um uh, you know uh, aspect not a technical so the coins were issued in the beginning 21 million and then they've been distributed you know being distributed um by you know to the nodes that mine and um you know you can't issue more legally um and um the utxos from a technical standpoint are just uh it's just like a, you can think of a bag that locks the tokens and um you know that's just uh, that's just how it works from a technical standpoint if you want to move them um you could you know just unlock that utxo uh somehow and then um it doesn't really matter technically how that happens because it is a um you know a, spe a special event uh, that needs to be treated differently, whether it's like, you know, up, uh, up, true, uh, up return or whatever, technically it doesn't really make much of a difference. Um, but the key thing here is not, there's no, there's no such uh, thing as, you know, you're not going to be reissuing and then, uh, you know, burning coins or whatever, that kind of thing. You're just, uh, um, you know, you're, you're changing the, the, the movement of the coins. Um, and, um, uh, you know, just, just to, just to, um, go through a couple of things in terms of the the technical uh standpoint so miners already um you know ex existing existing miners could technically blacklist any of the coins already uh on any chain on btc bch bsv or anything um you know all you need to do is just write like a firewall that's just gonna uh you know check the transactions and blacklist specific coins so that already is doable technically right on any chain and um, if even if you have hundreds of thousands of nodes on BTC or whatever, it doesn't matter because the miners are the ones that you know create new blocks. So if you're going to be blacklisting specific uh, coins, that means you're going to block those transactions that are moving those coins, right? And then um, you know all we all we did in in the the software is we made it easier to do, but technically you know, that could be definitely done uh, anywhere. And uh, the next step is you know once you have those coins um basically frozen somewhere you can't move them 
what do you you know the next logical step is what do you do with those coins right and in in most cases uh there's there's already so many cases where exchanges have been hacked um you know this the specific uh, events that happen of you know clear clear theft um and you can see the coins they're just you know in specific addresses literally um you know waiting for the hackers to pop their head out and, and move them right and um uh, you know so um it's it's already the case there's there's no um technical reason why these things can't uh, be done uh, so you can do anything at the end of the day um you know the, the legal controls are what trump you know everything uh, that sure. can be done in tech so so from like a philosophical if, if i could add something to that maybe not sure. less from the technical side but I, there's another myth that is functioning at in the broader crypto space and and as more specifically probably in the the btc and bch uh communities is that well there's no way a court like can, court order can be enforced on those networks or probably they that they have never been enforced but technically and theoretically they can be enforced and just just take an example of a, of a miner a big miner on btc that is maybe publicly listed that has huge facilities around across the globe on or, or like in in the us or the, let's say rule of law jurisdictions uh is hiring a lot of people is paying taxes paying utility and electricity bills and then it's served upon with a court order issued by a U.S. court that says, I hereby order you to stop processing and any transactions that involve the following coins because they were stolen or they were, they were subject of another crime. The question is what that miner would do. Probably there would try to defend. No, we are unable to do that. I mean, it's not. It's bit. It's Bitcoin BTC, and uh, it's it's impossible. They would try to probably challenge that such a court order. But I don't think they will be. They they would be successful in this, because as yeah. Jad just has just explained, it is technically possible for a miner, but it has never yet happened. Probably because either courts are also haven't been facing this kind of a challenge in the court because no one has applied for such a court order yet. Sure. Or also, you know, courts uh, or people are not applying for them because they, they believe in this myth that it's not possible. Right. So I would love to see, you know, a first court order that's being just, just, you know, purely without our digital asset recovery process, but using the method that Jad has just explained that is trying to be enforced on, on BTC and BCH, I would like to see reactions of the miners. And because uh, sure. that would that could bust the whole myth that uh, that that Bitcoin so is like outside of the role. A BTC. So that's the real the that's the real question there is, OK, let's say, you know, Foundry and F2 and Antpool and via BTC all are given a court order to move BTC. That's probably 60 or 70 percent of BTC's hash power right there now. The ardent UASF, like you know, one node, one vote, you know, kind of like, hey man, I'm 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 sovereign with my ponytail kind of guy is gonna say like, no, if we if we all collectively refuse to accept the blocks from that that cabal of miners, you know, this is this this very quickly becomes a sort of uh, you know revolution counter revolution among you know these people who assume they have power because they're node operators like they think they completely won this battle in 2017 that the nodes the non-mining nodes are paying i've been i've had people argue that they're the ones paying the miners by accepting their blocks and so like what what do you think this looks like in a practical sense if there was some kind of a you know, coup, counter coup, like minor civil war here uh, between these these players. Is this something that, um, you know, what, what does this look like? How does, and then I guess to follow up, like who does Kraken, Coinbase, Bitfinex, Huobi? Exactly. I, I, th I think what we've established, and, and as a BSV person, I'm looking at, you know, BSV and BCH was decided by, by the exchanges more than proof of work like they literally just colluded and said we'll just assign the ticker to whoever we want and so i'm i'm curious how do you think that plays out in that situation like does nakamoto consensus matter at all at this point or is it all about strong arming the corporate entities that control the on and off ramps 
uh, I think that that would be the case. So what would actually matter practically, I'm speaking less about you know legal side right now, would be how exchanges would treat it, like which which side would they follow? Whether those miners that try to, they are afraid of being in contempt of the court order because they are afraid of uh, receiving some, you know, their bank accounts being seized by the seized by the bailiffs and and and, and stuff. They, they they would they would just probably accept eventually, uh, and they would comply with the court order. And then what would exchanges do? Well, let's start with the U.S. exchanges. If there is a U.S. court order, I think they will abide. Similarly, as they are abide with the OFAC sanctions. I don't think you know uh, Kraken will, and Coinbase and others would risk also being in contempt of the court order because that court order actually can be quite broad. And I think it's it's very easy to imagine that actually the orders pro like requests the miners, but at the same time requests other entities for processing the transactions. And so if it's not such a, it's not uh, successful at the blockchain level. Then this is what's happening actually right now. I mean, exchanges are are being served. Yeah, we, we uh, see this all the time. Different. Exactly, and and they and they blacklist those coins. So, I don't think it's it's just we probably a, a first case needs to have need to happen to just show people that they've been believing a false narrative for a very long time. They've yeah. been told to believe that. Sure. And that would be kind of a paradigm shift. And it's, uh, it's, it's, it's going to happen sooner or later. And irrespective yeah. of, you know, BSV, DAR, uh, look, I, I just I just read just before joining this program is that uh, Bittrex was ordered to pay two significant fines today. One by FinCEN, it's like 20-something million, and the other by, by the office that, uh, that, you know, if it's OFAC or, or I think so, OFAC, around 20-something again, altogether 50-something. For uh, for for like uh, processing, you know, uh, funds uh, that were used and and uh, to 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 bypass sanctions on Iran and 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 some other sanctioned countries. Wow, yeah, there no, you it's, go. it's fascinating. So I'm I'm going to go through a couple of the the questions here um, in the in the box itself. So from Stephen, isn't this process too slow moving for crypto when people can instantly move and swap tokens around and dump them on a new victim? I actually think this is one of the the serious limitations. I've had a, a number of people say like, well, hey, what if I'm the 20th person down the line from coins that were proven to be stolen? Um, it, I, I think the law is crystal clear in that situation, just like it would be with cash. Like if, you, if you're holding cash that was stolen, but you can prove that you got it legally, I think the original victim is screwed and they, just, they, they have a debt with the thief, but they're not going to get their original property back. It's, that's that's how I would assume that would play out in most jurisdictions. But let me know what you think. Um, I'm not sure how it's gonna play in most jurisdictions. To be honest, uh, I, I I also can imagine, for example, that uh, uh, we've seen, I mean, we've heard stories about this. That you're walking, you know, down Miami Beach, and there is someone telling you, "Hey, you see this watch? I can sell it to you. It's a golden watch. I can sell it to you for fifty bucks." You say, "Well, what a deal! I'm gonna buy this." Yeah, and obviously the the watch was stolen. Five minutes later, police come say, "Hey, did you buy a watch from that guy?" I say, "Yes." Well, that that was actually stolen, and uh, you actually what you have you have a recourse against the thief. Not the, the the watch is not yours. You were possessing it, but you should assume or so. I I think that's one probably, but it maybe it's, it depends on the jurisdiction. But there are again, like we are coming back to the fundamentals. Like let's 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 not think about Bitcoin digital assets. What would happen with real life assets? There are you know people have been facing these challenges for decades and ages, right? Uh, things like this, and and there are there are legal ways how to solve these problems, and probably the same you would have to use the legal way. Applicable in your, in your jurisdictions, how to how to deal with this? Um, I can also, I mean, it all depends on the court order. Uh, referring to this question, if the court order is broad enough to also cover secondary wallets, then it's a matter just of the enforcement, right? And uh, I don't know. I'm I haven't seen the 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 actual notary tool. Uh, so the third element that hasn't been yet revealed, and it's going to be operated by a third party that will be authorized to that, or different maybe third parties. Um, 
maybe that tool can has a kind of a monitoring it monitors like 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 the uh, providers of you know like blockchain analytics companies are actually can monitor what happens with the assets when they are the transactions are obfuscated put through mixers and you are able to track that because we are talking about public permissions blockchain you know, everything is traceable in the end it might not be very efficient but this is more of a question how if at all i don't know this can be solve at the the notary tool level so i it sure. it, it can be up to to, so, to different people that will develop the so, so maybe the tool. <laughs> but yeah. and so i mean it's it's situational like a lot of things like if it if it can't be recovered then you know what's what's the rest of the process well and i think you know there's a few other examples where there are already some existing court order i mean mount cox for example has had a trustee and and this opportunity for i mean years at this point and and still no money has been distributed and that i'm aware of anyways and so, you know, could this be a way to, uh, you know, Im implore, implore them to move and be like, look, trustee, if, if you won't liquidate and give people the, the fair value, uh, could some other court supersede and say, hey, like we have a client that has hundreds of Bitcoin or thousands of Bitcoin that they've been owed since, you know, whatever it was, 2013 or 14 when it got hacked. Um, like what? How does something like that play out? Can can those UTXOs just be moved uh, in in that regard as, as well? Like it, again, it's more of a legal question than a technical one. But um, I think theor theoretically, yes, since these were pre-split bitcoins, I assume that they on the same wallets you still have also BCH and BSV. So if we focus purely on BSV and then the, the the software, the digital asset recovery tools that have been already released. They, you could you could freeze those. I, I I think it should be possible, but I haven't seen the court order issued in this case. Uh, maybe there wasn't a court order, but there was maybe another yeah. uh, document of equivalent value issued by you know the uh, law enforcement. Uh, I don't know, but theoretically, not knowing the details, I, I think it it would be possible. Sure. Uh, let's let's cut over to. Alan Toreg, um, and, and this is an interesting one. So if, if the ultimate aim is to build a mechanism which can be overwritten by authority, I, I think overwritten is probably the wrong word to use here, but uh, what is the point of using blockchain at all? And this has been another one that I've gotten nonstop. Like, Kurt, what, what do we need Bitcoin for at all if the government can just come in and arbitrarily, you know, m make us rewrite the ledger, essentially? So what's what's your thoughts on that? And Jod, we haven't heard from you in a while. If you want to yeah. comment here, <laughs> I have a few thoughts on that. Um, so, I guess it, you know, in a nutshell, Bitcoin doesn't really govern; it records things. We've never had a, a system that records like uh, Bitcoin ever in the history. Um, so, you know, so many different blockchains have been going around in circles trying to find the right, you know, governance mechanism and all of that stuff but uh um we like to you know we're just gonna be practical and pragmatic there already exists the whole governance system in the world bitcoin doesn't magically create a new world that exists you know separately um it fits it fits with within our our you know existing world right now and um it, it's it, people make it seem like oh an, an authority can just come in and do whatever but that's like you know that's that's kind of a, a it's not realistic uh you know what, what what's you know give, give me a scenario where that could happen um uh, you know where you could have like random authorities like you know stealing specific things and at the end of the day you know um people want to turn bitcoin into this like political thing but uh if you know if you want to use it to solve magically all of your political uh issues or whatever you know, I, I wish that were the case. I, I would love that for be, you know, for that to be the case. But it's, <laughs> you know, let's just be realistic. It's not going to, you know, Bitcoin. It records. It doesn't like govern. Sure. I think. I think that the, again, there's this the source of this is uh, because we we use the same words very often, the same terms, but we understand them differently. Like you know, decentralization and and stuff. But if if you understand blockchain. And Bitcoin, in the way as Jad described, and I believe as most of the people within the BSV understand, as a as as being subject to existing laws and more of a, a ledger that very specific one that has all the all the traits that make it so special, but still 
there is nothing special in under the law concerning it and you com you compare it with someone that, that that believes well i need blockchain to escape from the authorities so they cannot and you know affect anything that i'm i'm what i'm using blockchain for then we are talking about two different blockchains right kind of two different concepts and ideas of a sure. blockchain well, and speaking speaking of two blockchains, I, th I think that that you know one of the other things that gets brought up all the time is what if we have major jurisdictions that disagree? So, like, I mean, right now the major miners are in Japan, Canada, and the U.S. And what if two of the three, you know, they're able to get jurisdiction, but it gets blocked in in the United States? Or or what if uh, you know, for example, Ant Pool decides to switch over and they're just running a version of the software just out of not, not even malice. They're not even trying to accomplish anything except for, hey, maybe we should mine BSV. Um, what is it? What does that look like if all of a sudden there's, you know, a, an exa hash of power and most of it is, you know, just ignorant to it, and they're in a jurisdiction that can't be reached? Like, what is the, you know, do do you then like fundamentally? It's like, well, we're you know, the, there's a, a split here. There's two forks running in parallel. <laughs> like, what is the what does that look like, and how do, how do we mitigate some of the the risk there of just sort of a mix of the legal stuff and the technical stuff? Shall we start with the legal, or Jad, please? Sure. Okay, I'll start. Um, I mean, it's it's kind of unrealistic. Um, why would uh, a big miner just uh, you know mine for for no reason, waste waste money? And even if they do, who cares? At the end of the day. Um, you know, it's 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 in, it's insignificant, like a chain that's just uh, you know just mining separately, or uh, you know going on a on a different um, you know fork or or a different split. So ultimately, who really cares, right? This sure. <laughs> is my technical uh, answer. <laughs> yeah, no, it, well, and 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 that's and I I think the follow up question to that is, you know what? What what about the people who say, you know what? screw you and screw your new tool if you want your coins back like reorg the chain and redo the proof of work like isn't that the way that bitcoin is supposed to work um yeah <laughs> if i think that uh, that most people that that say that they don't really understand how bitcoin works they think that you have to like go back and, and reorg or uh you know something like that but it's you know, you don't, you don't, you don't need to, you don't need to do that. And anyway, it's not going to change anything because you don't have the keys. <laughs> Even if you go back and try right. to reorg, um, you're not going to, you know, how are you going to move those coins? You don't have the keys. You need a transaction to move them. So it's like, you know, what, what, what are you doing there? So let's, let's talk about a hypothetical. Like, let's say on BTC, they've got their, you know, the 12 nodes that mine blocks in a month. And then there's the, the 15 or you know, 50,000 nodes that do nothing but listen to the network. And let's say all of them in unison agree on something. Is, is there a technical limitation to what they can or cannot agree on? Like, for example, if they all agree that there should be 21,010 Bitcoins, like, does that, if they all agree that, that, that inherently, is, is this a hard fork upgrade? Let's say they all change the policy limits for what their node is going to validate on a given, uh, you know, on, starting at some block, they're they're able to coordinate. It w what happens in that situation? Just just as an example, so people understand what nodes are actually doing with what they're validating. Is your question Kurt, that if nodes just suddenly collude and want to um, issue more coins? Is that what you're saying? Or, or any other thing, like let, let's say they want to all they all agree to to change the way that difficulty is calculated, uh, and maybe they calculate difficulty every you know thousand blocks instead of every whatever it is two hundred and ten. Yeah. I, I forget. I think it's two hundred ten thousand okay. blocks on BTC. Yeah, this this is this is an interesting one, and it, it it's more of a, a legal um, answer. I, I'll I'll answer from my end, and then Martin could. Uh, correct if I've, if I've said anything but at the end of the day it's uh uh you know all, all the only real controls are legal you don't there's no um real technical controls that you know even the whole set in stone stuff it's it's all a legal thing um it's not uh you know from a technical standpoint you know uh, people that say oh you know this is decentralized and uh, you know it, it has to be from a technical standpoint it can't change but what if those people for example magic you know suddenly they all died 
and then new people showed up and just you know had a completely different understanding um you know that from a technical standpoint is completely doable but uh, you know it just de defeats the whole purpose so the only real um you know controls you have are legal controls and with bitcoin um you know from the start the, the system was created um and it was put out there and the creator of the system said that the system is set in stone the rules are set in stone um so that has legal weight behind it uh in comparison to things like um um uh, ethereum or some other blockchains they never made that um uh, uh, uh you know statement uh they, sure. they never put those yeah, they, they they never they never made those assurances or those guarantees that the system is set in stone. They you know they can change it. They have their own governance model, but with Bitcoin, the the the, the protocol um, is set in stone. Things like um, twenty one million coins being issued that's also um, you know part of the um, the unilateral contract. And if anyone you know if a miner wanted to come and uh, for example you know issue new uh, new coins, then um, you know, you could easily sue them there for, for damages, um, right? They're, you know, trying to, you know, ch change the protocol sure. or do something. Uh, another Breaking thing, you know, lateral contract or something. Yeah, so, yeah. so the, the set in stone, just let me just uh, finish with, with one last thing. So set in stone, um, you know, if, if they change the protocol, you say, for example, and then someone uh, had like a transaction that no longer is valid, then uh, you know that that causes damages to you, and you can sue them for for damages. That's why it's so important to um, you know have these legal controls in there so that things can't change. And then if things change, you have uh, legal recourse for you know to compensate for the damages. Yeah. Sure. I mean, the, the 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 example you gave with BTC, um, it it may not be very fortunate because that the, the BTC protocol has changed so many times right and uh, apparently it's still okay for the people for the miners that use it and people that believe in it but technically if we have today 11th of uh, October right and uh, the status of the state of BTC is X and tomorrow as you say they decide to I don't know issue to, to, to raise the maximum cap to 22 2 million so on the 12th when the, the, the rule is that we have 22 million BTCs it will not be that BTC anymore, right? The question is, and things like this happen in the past. Let's let's think about Ethereum, right? Actually, Ethereum Classic is the original Ethereum, but still, the, the let's say the the powerful players out there, mostly exchanges, and then decided that no, no, no. Actually, this 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 kind of new new chain, actually, right? is the original ethereum and you get you have to find your own name you have to come up with like okay well we'll be ethereum classic um so but but it, so coming back to to just question this is purely legal concept this is not anymore that protocol right and if maybe you said like all of them agree but what if there's one person that didn't agree to this that person technically could say well you you guys have just changed the terms of 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 our cooperation with the network, like you just change the terms of the of maybe that my asset that I I own was based on, and if you just I'll, I'll come back to real life example. If I, if if you, if you forget about this digital asset space, crypto, bitcoins, it, like in real life, if something someone does it, you can just go to court. Say like you guys, you've changed rules, something that you've agreed upon, and you've been you were bo bounded by this agreement, and you, you're now just not honoring it anymore and there are right. ways to do it and yes it, it's maybe there are not technical means to stop it if there is like a consensus but still it's purely legal right this is what we agreed in, 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 in you know democracies and 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 rule of law states yep. and, and 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 so on no for sure and and, and i did i'd agree actually it's you know especially in the case of ethereum and ethereum classic i think that that's even an, an even clearer I think that's actually one of the most clear uh, uh, examples of just an outrageous it's governance a good change. For us. Well, right. I mean, it just it sets a ridiculous precedent, frankly. That like, well, the exchanges and and Vitalik and you know whoever else have decided this is Ethereum now, and like, so what do you what do you say to the kind of person that looks at this and says, yeah, sure, like we we understand that Bitcoin and property law and blah blah blah, but. 
aren't we inherently like, isn't this an inherently different tool because of all, all of these reasons? And like, should we not want to at least give a little bit of protest given this new tool? Like it's the same thing with cryptography itself or like PGP was created by people who were, were politically minded. Like this was, you know, going back 20 plus years now and, and saying, Hey, we should be able to communicate encrypted over an adversarial channel in ways that that nobody can stop us and maybe parts of it are gray area illegal but isn't it a net good to essentially do a non-violent protest to push the culture forward so what, what do you say to people that that um that would give you that example it's a more of a philosophical right. question right that's just because well you can if the laws change because there was a you know, there are ways in democracy how you can affect the, the legislative process, right? You can have your own initiative. You can, you can uh, in your constituency, you can go to your uh, MP, right? And try to do it that way. You can find a, a former lobbying group and try to lobby that in the local parliament. And you can then that way try to affect that the laws change. And coming back to what I said at the beginning, that Bitcoin operates within the existing laws. If the laws change in a different, in a way that will differently assess digital assets well so be it because what big what bitcoin bitcoin's blockchain really is is just a is it's just a ledger right very special but still it's just a ledger so there are also ways like in our lives and maybe it's not it's not a, a satisfactory answer to many of the people and they are like and they are they are overrepresented within the digital asset space that believe that well, maybe we're creating something that shouldn't be controlled by by the governments that that should change the world for for for, for good in a, this kind of organic way, right, from the bottom up. Sure. But there is still we we are still functioning in real life, right? And uh, in the end, if we we want blockchain and and Bitcoin to be massively adopted. And as a technology, as a technology of, you know, processing transactions and in some cases storing data or we will not have it following such a belief and following such a, such principles, as I just mentioned, like sure. this kind of anarcho utopian, right? Because they are like, I mean, there are no serious player will, 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 will try to use it. But just to be, just to be devil's advocate, and just as devil's advocate, you know, I'm thinking Could about you mind like, if I just add something there <laughs> before, yes. before you change the subject <laughs> because yeah because there's a lot of like crypto anarchists and stuff that were attracted to the space initially and if you look at this scenario you know anyway there's a big difference between governments and the law right government and law is not the same thing even in in you know the the most uh, uh hardcore anarchists like you know the guys in the mises uh, institute and all of you know, Hans Hermann Hoppe and stuff, they believe in private law, right? Um, versus like public and statutory law. And, um, you know, uh, property law, that's like, you know, the, the starting point. And um, theft is, you know, it's still, it's still illegal in any, in, you know, in any of these uh, legal systems, right? Um, so, you know, that, that, that would apply. And if you, you know, people would say things like, uh, uh, you know, this is going to be abused or whatever, that's a that's not a problem with bitcoin that's a problem with the legal system and if you want a better legal system then that's not you know that's a, a, a you know an umbrella above bitcoin and you know that's yeah, that's uh, why that's why we have separation of powers right we have judiciary that is actually also to control the government if the government i don't know seizes your your car coming back to that example there is a way you have a legal recourse you can go to court and, and sue the government, right? Because, well, there were no reasons for my car to be sued and I, I can prove it. And if the if if the powers are like truly separated, you can obtain a judgment against the government. Sure, but but yeah, again, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna push one more time just for the sake of the people who I know are reeling is like, you know, what, what about Rosa Parks? You know, like you're in a jurisdiction where you're in, in a country where we're, you're supposed to be free by the law, but you live in a state where, and the local sheriff is a prick and, you know, and, 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 and this is, and this is real. Like these, these things are not arbitrary. 
Like we have had, even in this country, the allegedly freest country in the world. And granted, I'm the American here, and I know you guys are not, but, um, but when I'm know, Lebanese, it's, it's yeah, it's not it's not hard to hate the government. I know, <laughs> no, and, 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 you know, and that's, that's <laughs> a great example too. You know, <laughs> John, you know, like you live in a country where, like, or you're from a country rather where you know, like the, these kind of things change on a dime. Sometimes, you know, maybe you go to bed one night with your government and your laws are all one way and you wake up in the morning and they're very different. And so like, that's, that's the fear that I know a lot of people have. And it's, it's that fear that drove a lot of people to Bitcoin in the first place. Like some of these people haven't experienced it firsthand, but they have family or, you know, I'm my, my wife, for example, is descendant of people that had to flee Europe because of world war two. Like some of them spent years in Siberian work camps and, and other things. And like, they look at, at, the separation of money and state as this essential step to the next stage in, in human, you know, evolution, freedom, whatever else. And I think people look at this and their their fear is that this is a back step. And like some somehow we have to address that in such a way where <laughs> you know, like but there's a difference between separation of money and state and separation of law and the state, right? Does it sure. Yeah, and 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 a lot of people that say Bitcoin fixes that you know you need to be realistic. A lot of people don't see the you know the technical details um, of Bitcoin. Now, I would love if Bitcoin fixed all of these things, but you know let's be re realistic and try to you know get the most out of things. And and you yeah. know just on on the government's thing, you know that's why it's a great thing that there is no world government, right? So yeah, like I, I would ask like, what's the alternative? If the alternative, like in, in the mind of those people that are raising this argument or like you being the devil's advocate, it's like, okay, Bitcoin fixes it. But what if what, what if those free miners that you mentioned collude and they seize your coins and you're like, where do you go? Like you cannot go to court if you still believe that, you know, Bitcoin is outside of the law. Someone, I mean, there are three powerful players that can just do something with, with your assets and like there is no way to, to do it. And you're and in that way you are totally helpless. I mean, like, well, and probably those those people will then say, well, well, I'll use the legal legal system to actually recover my assets. You know, I'll go to court, I'll seek a judgment against against all those those miners because I don't think they 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 they, they broke the argument, right? Kind of that. Sure. Yeah. Well, and, and you know, and and I get that too. I I know people that are self-ascribed anarchists, but they still, you know, they, they own a corporation and they pay their corporate taxes because they don't want to end up in prison. But I mean, there's a difference between anarchy and lawlessness, right? It, I, some, I think some so. People, I, you know, on, on some sure. people, I, I haven't been been seeing that, especially on Twitter and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> I just just so you guys know, we're we're right at the top of the hour. I'm wondering if it's okay if we go over a little bit and keep the conversation going. Sure, I don't sure. Mind. Okay. So, all right. So we'll we'll get back to a couple more of these questions in here. Um, I wanted to get back to the question that you raised about um, backdoors and in, in cryptography and encryption. please, yeah. So because that 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 that's a good one. And when I when I first uh, you know heard about this stuff, I thought this is very similar to like a backdoor. You know, studying security and cryptography myself, I'm obviously against backdoors in, in encryption or any type of cryptography but um you know if you if you think things through properly is um first of all bitcoin is not a cryptographic algorithm right it's an economic system and it's not like a cryptographic algorithm that can be broken by cryptanalysts or you know um uh, you know adding a, a backdoor is going to make it um in, insecure the way you know it would make encryption insecure and with backdoors on, on, on encryption you never know when someone's used it, if they've used it, how many times they've used it. You you never know that if the NSA or GCHQ or whatever you know is is uh, is using a specific backdoor. That's why all of the uh, the cryptographic algorithms have to be uh, public, or else you don't know if there's a backdoor in there, right? Um, and you know the the whole the the strength of things is being public. You know, you can never know if there's a if there's a backdoor in the cryptographic algorithm unless it's public and tried and tested and put out there right and that's kind of the same mentality with bitcoin it's not a it's not a cryptographic algorithm it's a it's an economic system and then when these things are used um it's not it's there for the whole world to see right it's completely public 
um, you know, if if uh, something is um, abused or whatever, it's there for the you know the 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 future generations to see forever. You know, this this happened, right? It's it's out there. There's no encryption in Bitcoin, and um, and that's that's kind of the way. The way and it's and 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 the way digital asset recovery process works, right? You have miners that not are not anymore. You know, people mining in their basements. But they're like, in case of Tal, is a public listed company in terms of like everybody knows that even you yourself as a, as a founder of Gorilla Pool, there is there is a lot at stake here, and you are dis- disincentivized to actually use it somehow. I don't know why, how, but if people are afraid that you know this whole system can be used in a in a way to to, to abuse its in, like uh, initial role. This is the also the beauty of the of Bitcoin, right? That the miners are real existing players, and you know who they are, and you can also seek legal recourse if they do something bad, right? You're paying like you, it's that's it's again, you know, going totally in a different way than the the whole anarchy utopian vision for 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 sure. Bitcoin. So, you know, the the way that I've always thought of it is uh, and i see some people commenting in the troll box too that like a miner is essentially they're they're like the fiduciary notary of the system in in a basic sense is that you know the the nodes receive what they receive they relay what they can like they can set their own node policies but ultimately that you committing proof of work and time stamping a block is essentially you uh, advocating with the strength of your signal that you are you're taking a fiduciary role uh, putting your reputation on that block with a sufficient amount of proof of work, and so, and and I I I understand that this is a political difference between big blockers and small blockers, and we agree that these things are are different roles. There's this this notion, and there are people in all camps that are saying what's being attempted here is impossible. That this is this is another one of those things that like the tech can't do that, and so. So two questions, uh, the set in stone narrative, like what does it, what does it mean in the sense, like what parts are set in stone? Because, you know, I understand that this is, you know, defined in law and whatever, and we can sue and, and, you know, you figure out what, what your real rights are in court. And this is how the system works too, in a constitutional Republic, like, Hey, my rights are being violated. Great. It goes all the way to the Supreme court. And eight years later, we determine whether or not my rights were violated. But, um, what do we say to the people like, and here's my here's one of my criticism was with Satoshi actually is like why didn't we get a protocol spec like why isn't there an actual obvious legal definition of Bitcoin and is that possible is it possible for there to be a protocol spec at this point that defines what precisely is set in stone like a legitimate constitution for lack of a better term um I think you need to invite Satoshi to your program to answer some of these questions because he will be there. I know this is a, h- a harder question. <laughs> the source yeah, let, of original interpretation, but uh, uh, Jad, let's please go. Let, let me let me um, just add a couple of things on, on what I was saying before. The, you know, the the most important we could thing we could do is set up all of the legal structures and and the legal systems in play that will you know set these things actually in stone properly with the you know the unilateral contract and. Uh, you know all of the the rights there, and uh, set in stone is some people take it to be like a religious kind of thing, and um, or a technical thing, which is you know first of all it's not a religious thing, second of all it's not a technical thing because you know from a technical standpoint there there are no real guarantees. Now like you can see on BTC, Peter Todd is like advocating for adding inflation into into BTC, and from a right. you know from BTC they don't have any legal controls. They have the you know this it's soft forks. They could change whatever they want and. You know, uh, what if Peter Todd just decides to convince everyone? It's you know, it, the 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 legal the real controls with BTC is like you know Twitter. You need to be on Twitter on Ethereum as well. You need to be on Twitter to see what's the what's the consensus floating around, right? You can't plan long term, hundred years into the future. You can have contracts that you know last you know decades or whatever, um, you know, or and um, the the only le- legal controls that you can have. It for uh, for set in stone is if someone does something that actually changes things in a way that you're damaged. So in in the law, uh, you know the law is there not to punish people; it's to get people back to the position that they were 
you know, had the, the damage or, you know, um, whatever happened not taken place, right? Um, and if something is set in stone and you go off and you change something, for example, if you have uh, specific transactions that you, you've signed, you, contrary to what people think, you don't have to broadcast the transaction straight away when you sign it, right? When it's ready, you know, you could create things like trusts or whatever. So you could have a trust that lasts like, you know, decades. If uh, the protocol developers, whatever, change something, or the nodes or change something, then you, you're now damaged, right? You could sue for the damages that you, you've had, right? If they think of, you know, in, increased inflation, right? Now you're damaged and because they've decreased the value of your holdings. So every, everyone in the system is a class action lawsuit. They could sue them, um, right. you know, so, so the, you know, that's where the, the legal system comes into play where, um, you know, it's set in stone from, a, because everyone's agreeing to this contract to use the Bitcoin mm -hmm. system with these set rules and they're set for forever. If anyone comes and changes something and damages you, you have legal recourse. That's, you know, the, the only real um, controls are legal, basically. Sure. And this, so, and, this, and this terms and conditions, let's call it like the unilateral contract that sets the terms and conditions for Bitcoin, like how nodes and miners operate with each other, what are the rules? It's still a legal concept and it's, and it's subject to to applicable laws, right? And even if you read, um, of course, it's uh, probably it's better to uh, to invite uh, Satoshi himself and, and and ask him that for original interpretation. But the last sentence of the white paper says that uh, the you can enforce other rules with this consensus. Um, maybe this is a source also for. For saying like what are the rules right but if you if you if you leave with this basic assumption that bitcoin is not in itself outside of the laws but it's operating with the laws it's like me and you we can agree on something in our contract because what we cannot agree on something that is against the the, 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 the like the binding laws right there right. are certain rules like we cannot just agree i like, we we agree to kill jad right i, I i'm paying you to kill jad this is, obviously this this argument is per se it's like from it from it, in its in its in its beginning is it's it's invalid because well it's against the public order and against higher values and in different jurisdictions probably will be treated differently but that's it so what what do you say to the people and and this is I, you wouldn't even believe what my dms look like guys like when they when they tell me this is all just all this stuff all the you know the this interview, all the papers, all the videos, all the explainers, all, all of this is smoke and mirrors. We all just work for Craig. And this is Craig. Craig is just going to steal Satoshi's BSV. But that's the, that has been the end. This is the culmination. You call us, Craig. You call us. Of, Red <laughs> right. So, I mean, but, but, but really, I mean, the culmination of four years of BSV, everything was always no, about decades, decades, de like, right. Yeah. <laughs> Since 2006, Craig has been planning to steal Satoshi's BSV. And, and that's where we're at today. What's the, what, what is your response to that? Um, you know, to, to the critics? Um, well, I, I know it's probably easy for people to connect the dots, right? How oh, there is this, and I forget about the initial 1 million, satoshi coins but uh it's not it's also functioning public domain that there was uh, this other lawsuit what what were where, where some certain coins were, were were allegedly stolen from from tulip trust and we know who controls tulip trust limited it's greg that he will probably try to recover uh these assets using the software that you know our well, bitcoin association for bsb has just released uh, the first argument is like well anyone can use this well, anybody that has a valid court order, well, that miners, and this is this is the beauty of it. It's not Bitcoin Association that's going to, at any stage, be the one enforcing potential cracks court order. Mm -hmm. It's going to be miners, right? They will be crack through the you, using the digital asset recovery system. Will be actually putting this burden on miners. The miner need to either respect it or not. This is their risk. Well, so well, I, I could say like, why why put the blame on Bitcoin Association, right? Um, but what if there is a, what if there is another court case? And I assume there mu there must be some court orders. And I think with 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 us, like opening this this kind of 
box of Pandora, mm -hmm. showing to the world that this is this is possible. It's possible on BSV, but it's also possible on BTC and BCH. And theoretically, sure. under law, has always been possible. Maybe there will be other people, victims of uh, hacks, uh, Mount Gox, as the example that we, sh we 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 mentioned. What did they try to do it? If before Craig, before Craig tries to do it, uh, I don't know if right. he will try. But uh, yeah. what would the critics say? Will they be against you know like poor victims of a hack of of, of an exchange or or Let's give another example. Uh, what if there is a um, like? Let, let's move to the inheritance law. If Kurt, you own 50, 50 BSVs, well, I don't wish you that, but something happens to you, and you know your children and your wife will inherit that. Mm -hmm. And they know that you have those BSVs. They even know the wallet addresses. But they don't know private keys because you know you put the keys I don't know to a safe or you just uh, gave it to Jad and they don't know that Jad has them. Uh, <laughs> what then? And they would like to recover those, yep. so they will have their right. They will belong to their to the estate. They will have rights to that, but they will they will not have any mean if not for digital asset recovery. Oh, we lost the him. connection. <laughs> he was frozen for me for the last like. Yeah, he was uh, he was frozen for me too. So he must have a bad connection. Um, mm. Judd, let's talk yeah. a little bit about. Um, you know, it keeps being mentioned. We've we've all said it a couple times. Like this is possible on BTC and BCH as well. Now I know mm. for a fact there are various differences among the chains. There's all kinds of soft fork rules. There's uh, differences in script. There's different script uh, limits and all these other things. Is this mm. something that would need to be? worked on or would this be ready to deploy like let's say you know foundry and um you know th th like all these btc pools were, were to be implored it, is the software mm -hmm. avail available on btc bch etc uh personally i don't really care much about like you know the the other chains um yeah mm -hmm. for, for me it doesn't really, I, I don't see them lasting very long. So I don't really spend much time looking into, you know, what, what could be done there. Um, so technically, I, I don't know, from a technical, fundamentally, from a technical standpoint, you know, all this stuff can be done. Um, and I'm not, I'm not sure what, what your question exactly is, but. Um, so I guess just from a, a practical standpoint, like let's, yeah. let's say Mount Gox says, Hey, you know what? Mm. Like this whole process is taking a long time and somebody does get a court order uh, that mm. they want their bitcoins and it's ambiguous, but they want their BTC, BCH, BSV and whatever else. Is this tool available to function in Bitcoin core, Bitcoin ABC, like all, all the implementations now, or is there extra work that would need to be done technically to, to get it to work on the other chains? Um, I think, I'd, yeah, I'd, I'd have to check uh, the, the technical, um, yeah, details, uh, but uh, there's, there's no there's no real reason stopping, um, especially, you know, people will say uh, things like, oh, you know, we have full nodes on BTC, thousands of full nodes or whatever. Uh, at the end of the day, the only people that update them, the, the ledger, or the the actual miners, right? And then you right. could say, oh, the full nodes are not going to accept it. Um, and we've seen empirically the second uh, split with BCH and and uh, BSV saw that nodes don't really matter. It's actually the exchanges, right? And exchanges technically they don't need to run a full node. At the end of the day, whatever chain they decide to follow and use, right? Um, that's the one that, uh, you know, they, they choose essentially what, what they're doing with running a node is just choosing a chain. You could choose a chain without running a full node. You could run like a light client, you could run anything. Um, and, uh, that's what scared the, the miners in both cases, which is mainly the exchanges because they just want to sell their coins. Um, and, uh, so exchanges already have a lot of this stuff in place. They have this stuff and even more <laughs> look at chain yeah, analysis actually, and all this stuff. Right. A, a company within, like Coinbase like probably has seconds. the most sophisticated stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Within like 30 second, uh, 30 uh, minutes, um, chain analysis, you know, if, if coins become blacklisted or something, they're notified all the exchanges uh, to freeze those coins or whatever. So, you know, all of this stuff already exists, right? Um, and the laws already exist, all this stuff. So it's not really new. Um, Crazy been talking about this for <laughs> since like 2019 or something. Yeah. A few years um, for sure. So, yeah. Uh, 
And, and I think it's just also a matter of time um, until someone develops a node implementation for BTC that has those those features that can you know th that we implemented in version 1.0.9 in October that in conjunction with blacklist manager that you know miners on BTC BCH can uninstall they allow for freezing the coins and I don't think that you know voluntarily the next day after all the BTC miners will suddenly you know up to start running that node implementation and will install the blacklist manager never as nevertheless just the fact that this will be available will prevent those miners from su successfully defending themselves in court yeah. right imagine that there is a you know you if we have this court order and you want to have to freeze or have the btcs reassigned you're going to the against the miners try to enforce it the miners are saying well we would love to but it's impossible we don't have technical means well here you are there's the you know a, this node implementation you can run it there is you can just install blacklist manager that we are bitcoin association release maybe someone else will develop an alternative to blacklist manager there you go for sure so correct me where i'm wrong i i've i've thought about this at length it, initially my response to the concept was just like most people like well, how'd that even be possible? But as, as I've come to, you know, I, I like operating a pool and understanding how things work more deeply, um, you know, understanding what like the nature of consensus and, and, you know, what is possible in Bitcoin. And I think a lot of these questions are actually instructive. You know, as I'm looking at the troll box and people saying like, well, what if, what if a court order comes from here and it takes this and that, and uh, you know, then jurisdictions are fighting and people can't agree and all this stuff. And it's, and I'm, I'm, I'm literally sitting here and thinking, it sounds like courts might be sufficiently decentralized for this to be a very rarely used tool in that it would, first of all, it, it costs a lot of money to even begin the process. Like we're talking to the tune of many tens of thousands of dollars in legal fees just to pursue this. And therefore somebody who's, you know, nobody's going to go after this for, ah, shoot, you know, I lost. 80 bucks worth of coins on, you know, in some kind of, you know, petty theft or a hack or something. So, you know, as, as I, I continue to, to, to think about it, I keep thinking like, okay, well, how does this even occur? If, if there's like, maybe there's an arbitration day once a quarter or something like that, where everybody that's received an order and it's gone all the way through all the processes, maybe we process like an arbitration block or something similarly named on a on a regular basis but i i feel like because of the difficulty of all of this multi-party all the jurisdictional stuff and all of that that this would be a very infrequently used tool which then strikes me as again in bitcoin everybody loves to argue about edge cases that we've never seen in the mm -hmm. wild but you can go back also and from find... an incentive from an incentive standpoint right if people well, see sure. that you know it's done once like you know, for insecurity, the you have to, you don't have to prevent something from happening, right? It's all about incentives. There's no such thing as being 100% secure. It just needs to be, you know, uh, more secure than the hacker gets out of uh, attacking right. it, right? And if a hacker knows sure. that, you know, if he if he attacks, steals like uh, five billion dollars, it's easily going to be returned. Why would anyone even spend any time doing it, right? So from, and, from you know, maybe I, that would. I have an too, example. Right? That might sound as an edge case, but I think, like, we'll, if 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 the adoption of of blockchain, if the adoption of Bitcoin uh, actually uh, grows, uh, it will not be such a rare case. Uh, think about, uh, you know, we are talking about digital assets. You know, obviously, we probably most people think about, you know, native coins, BSVs, right? Uh, I lost fifty BSVs. I want to recover them. It's not economically sustainable to pay for all the legal fees to have them recovered so i'll just pass but what if there is a <clears throat> self-sovereign identity some someone's self-sovereign identity sure. based, like as, an, as a form of nft or a smart contract that is based on bsv uh, similarly like if you use your id or someone steals your id you can go to law enforcement and say well i would like to report that and i would like my id to be like i don't know cancelled and i have want to have a new one and if mm -hmm. someone steals your digital identity that is connected to your health records, uh, uh, university diplomas, and so on and so forth, probably it can be law enforcement that will be able to at least freeze 
you know, to go to go so, so you'll ne not have to invest all this money uh, and legal fees initiating a civil case. You will just go through law enforcement. They can go to police, report it, sure. and maybe they there will be a mean if they will have, be able to operate the notary tool. They will be sending a uh, broadcasting this 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 order to minors and say, hey, well, Kurt's Kurt's uh, ID digital ID was stolen. Please at least freeze it so it cannot be used uh, for illicit activities. Um, it's interesting. So like essentially creating various titles and things that, that have this tool uh, in mind in their fundamental and, and, design. And, and lack of this possibility, I think, is actually uh, stopping the adoption of blockchain in general. Uh, because like, why would you put like at least public permission is blockchain? Like why would like which kind of government would like to base land registry system, land registry system on a public permission is blockchain? What if like, you know, there is a... Again, someone dies, and this title to land is inherited. But like, how do you how do you move it? This right, if you do, if this public permission is blockchain, that you cannot tamper with right? anyway. Even if there is a valid court order. Yeah. So, all right, we're getting near ninety minutes here. So, I'm I'm, I'm going to let you guys have a closing thought, or if there's something you wish I asked, or something that you definitely want to let people know if they're watching before we wrap up. What what would that be? You want to go first, Martin? <laughs> I'm going to repeat myself. Probably I said that already five times. Okay, maybe, maybe I'll, there I'll go. Nothing, <laughs> there is nothing in Bitcoin that makes it, you know, as an that puts it outside of the applicable law. Like if you come with this assumption, at least maybe if you're not BSV supporter, but if you try to at least understand what we are, what we are actually, we've been saying for the last 90 minutes, I think it starts to make sense. You may not agree with this, but it, it makes sense at least. And this is probably how, uh, not probably, but this is how Bitcoin, the original Bitcoin was designed for and, and should be understood. John? Um, yeah, I think just to reiterate the, the main point I was saying is that the only real controls you can have are legal controls, technical, uh, controls, you know, they're, they're not really any, not many guarantees there. Uh, the whole, you know, mystical, like religious uh, thing. Uh, obviously, that's <laughs> very, you know, a huge myth. So uh, the only thing we could do is to, to have like a proper stable foundation is to get all the legal controls there. And um, actually, I, I wanted to, to mention one thing I was going back and forth with uh, Stefan Kinsella on, on Twitter about something similar um, and he was talking he has a, a interesting like uh, um, perspective uh, where he says that you uh, you know bitcoin's not ownable um, you, you can't own uh, uh, bitcoin and i think he, he tries to um, his argument is, is similar to his argument for ip um, and um, i i think bitcoin is fundamentally different uh, you, you know bitcoin will uh, like in, introduce uh, um, property rights to the digital world, right? Because there's only you know, 21 million, it's, it's scarce. So the, the argument with, uh, you know, not being able to own information uh, and, and his whole uh, stuff around intellectual property is um, uh, is kind of a whole different paradigm with Bitcoin. So I think it's gonna be, um, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I thought that was, that was an interesting um, uh, perspective, which I, I hadn't seen before. All these other things yeah. it, on, on Twitter, in my opinion, are very, um, a very surface level. Oh, Craig, you're going to sure. steal Craig's coins. You're going to, you know. <laughs> it's it's funny. I, I have to call out, like, I've, I've been a follower of Stephen Kinsella for at least a decade, and he actually informed my view on intellectual property. And I was an anti-intellectual property guy for many years until it occurred to me that owning Bitcoin was essentially owning a, a series of, a unique series of numbers, which, in like, changed my view on intellectual property to the point where like I came to uh, understand and agree with the fact that you could own patents or, you know, own intellectual mm -hmm. property. So I, I find it, first of all, very intellectually mm -hmm. um, consistent of Stephen to say you cannot own Bitcoin because you can't own non-physical property. So good, good on him for being consistent. Yeah, but just, just on that. It, um, I think he also got that wrong. You, you don't own the actual numbers. So the numbers are the private keys or whatever you own the right. you, you own the bitcoin which is recorded on the ledger right and then right you know, um 
Yeah. Which which is controlled by the the numbers kind of. Sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just think, I, I think I've just difficult. I think I've just made the biggest mistake ever because I opened the comment section which I kept closed for the whole for the whole session. <laughs> and well, that's why comment, but, man. I, I want us to get everything <laughs> out. We need to get out here. Yeah. But but it, but it reminded me about one issue that we need to clarify. And uh, we've been open about this, and it's an FAQ section. It was in the statement that Bitcoin Association published after uh, you know the, the settlement argument uh, between TTL and BA uh, got 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 publicly available. Mm -hmm. It's like at no point in time, Bitcoin Association is mm -hmm. going to be involved in enforcement of any court orders with with the use of the of the blacklist manager, the notary tool. We will Bitcoin Association will not operate the notary tool. It, 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 that's it. Like we did our job, kind of. We released the software, the Node software implementation, in October mm -hmm. last year, and the newest version that will follow, right? And we released the blacklist manager. That's it. Yeah. We will. It, it will be a third party that will receive a plaintiff's court order or a document of equivalent value, and then this third party operating the third tool that has not been yet released will be broadcasting into the miners and miners are also like kind of third parties to us right. and you, you can have hundreds of miners right some of them hostile to us and that's it that's the that's the beauty of the whole system it, so the whole narrative that bitcoin association is going to you know reassign someone coins someone's coins or will be controlling the system it's it's just flawed i I appreciate it. Uh, you know, I've, I've also had people ask like, hey, what, you know, what about that license? Bitcoin or BSV specifically isn't open source that the license doesn't let you fork it and blah, blah, blah. Um, do you have any comments on on that stuff before we wrap up? Because I know that's going to be a follow up that everybody's going to ask me why I didn't ask. Oh, my goodness. That's a, that's, that's, a, that's a topic for another for a whole another uh, all right episode, next Tuesday. Um, well, it it is open sourced, right? Because the code is available. You can still, I mean, as any as any right holder, you, you copyright holder, you you decide what you want to do with the with your copyrights, right? You can you can license them freely. You can can sell them out. You cannot, maybe you can just, just keep them to yourself. So I'm not going to license to anyone. You can use different license, open source, MIT, GPL. You can sell proprietary license for money, for cash. Yep. We we decided, and then Bitcoin Association decided, after investing so much money into actually the, the development of the SV Node software, that the only way to that these funds are used in a proper way being aware of all the past experiences with forks and uh, in the past, etc., that we allow you to, to 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 see the code, we allow you to play with the code, to build actually on top of the code, to to use it as long as it's used on BSV blockchain. Yeah. So you are allowed to do whatever you, you you like as long as you do it. You can release you know a, a, an alternative node software version that will maybe become even more popular than the one we release and we are happy with this right like this is this is it but you you can use it only on SV, on an mbsv blockchain sure. and this is like right our right as a, as the right holders as those that invested money in the development and we can do it and then this this was yeah. the decision that we made and i, I also agree I, I i can understand that some people don't like it maybe um that because they would like to fork they would like to use this intellectual property but i mean this is the way it is right no i i i can appreciate that and it's actually that's how we understood the license too like when we run like I, i've always been an advocate that every mining pool should take the reference client and modify it at least a little bit to be particularly functional on their own equipment and to their own means. And because that's the commercial interest, like that's your part of your commercial edge anyways. So, um, okay. Any, any other closing thoughts before we wrap up here? All right. Marcin, good. Jod, you good? All good. All right. Gentlemen, thank you. I know this was, uh, probably not the most fun or or most uh <laughs> uh you know whatever not not the, not the greatest thing to be doing on a tuesday evening for for either of you guys but uh, i think it was important because i think a lot of uh there's just a lot of bad information out there about bitcoin in general but 
Um, but but I think this in particular is is particularly uh, deeply misunderstood, and I think we've answered the obvious questions. But I'm I'm sure we'll have follow ups, and uh, <laughs> uh, I, I I guess that's it. So I'll I'll just leave it at that. I'll say thank you, and uh, we can we can talk soon. Thanks. Thank Thanks, you. guys. Good. Thanks, guys. Cheers. <clears throat> So, all right, I'm going to just, just some closing thoughts. You know, I, I just want to let everybody know uh, personally, you know, that, that I have my own reservations about everything when I hear a new idea about Bitcoin. I, I have been a critic of, of various things. Uh, you know, people like to act like I'm, I'm not an independent thinker. Or I'm not an independent mind in Bitcoin because I'm, you know, I am who I am. I'm, I'm doing a coin geek show or whatever else, but uh, you know, like like I said earlier in the show that, you know, I, I wish Satoshi gave us a protocol spec. Uh, I also personally don't like the uh, the inflation or not the inflation schedule, the uh, the distribution schedule. I think the block reward and the time that the subsidy exists has been a detriment to the way that Bitcoin has been adopted. Now, that's something Satoshi probably couldn't have or I mean, certainly couldn't have known. But the way that it's played out is that the subsidy has created a certain amount of behavior that has allowed people to be very lazy and get rich anyways. And I, I think that a lot of the conversations that we're having among big blockers and small blockers is a consequence of that. Now, I also don't think it's worth changing. Like, obviously, you could just change it and create a fork and whatever else, and, and then you're in a different situation. But but these these sorts of things where we have a fundamental disagreement with the nature of the system kind of doesn't matter because what we're really looking at is it's a unique thing that we just have to deal with. And it's like, there might be a property of gold or silver that we don't like that, hey, wouldn't it be great if gold had a, a different specific weight or a different amount of con uh, conductivity? Or why isn't there more of it to be able to allow us to build more electronics with gold? And these are all complaints we can have about reality, but we cannot change reality. And to, to paraphrase, uh, one of my favorite movie lines of all time is that whatever happens, happens and could not have happened any other way. And that's kind of how I see this tool and anything in Bitcoin occurring is that there are lots of things that have happened in the history of Bitcoin that drive me nuts. I am a very political person. I have a deeply philosophical view about basically everything. But if Bitcoin can be social engineered away and then the government can do x and then the response of node operators and miners is y and then we have to live in a world where shoot i really don't like this consequence but i can't roll back time just like i can't really roll back bitcoin and i think we just have to accept that there are certain things we can control and there are certain things that we just have to we have to deal with we have to work through them around them build upon them try to build something better going forward, but, but we can't change reality. And, you know, if the reality is inconvenient or if it's distasteful, uh, you know, I mean, look at the rest of the world right now. I mean, we're literally talking about nuclear war and we're talking about, you know, the splitting up of, of old unions and, and all kinds of other things. We're looking at, at some of the worst inflation in, in the last, you know, several generations in a row here. But what can we do to change it? Like we can't, like we can complain. Like complaining is a thing to do about it, but that's not necessarily going to put food to mouth. It's not going to make people feel safe. It's not going to keep people secure in their homes. It's not going to keep people secure in their wealth. It's not going to just deeply fix fiat currency in, in the near term. And ultimately, I want us to fix these problems, but fixing these problems looks a lot like hard work. And so as a closing thought, um, I just want to say that even though a lot of us disagree and a lot of us are going to continue to disagree, I want everybody to know, including all the commenters here, all these people, uh, you know, a lot of people who disagree in the troll box today. I want you to know that your humanity should be the, the paramount thing, that each of us should see each other's humanity and we should take our political differences and our, our, our ideas that are different about Bitcoin and sometimes set them aside and let the other person know like, hey, we're not at war right now with each other and I value you as a person. So that's, that's my challenge. Look at your enemy and say, you know what? You're not an enemy. You're an opponent. You're someone maybe I'm competing with in the economy, but let's, let's be people. Ultimately let's be good to each other. So 
everybody, I'm Kurt Walker Jr. This has been the CoinGeek Weekly live stream. It's been a 96-minute show. So if you've watched the whole thing, congratulations. You deserve a prize. So uh, I will see you next Tuesday uh, at the normal time with a more normal schedule and, and many other things. So I'm going to wrap up. Thank you to everybody. Take care and goodbye. Bitcoin SV is, is generating like an insane number of transactions. No, that, that, that's from artificially created demand. It, it may well be that a lot of the people using Bitcoin SV today are doing it, you know, as, as a proof of concept. But nevertheless, they are doing it on a public system that we can all verify and watch. And, you know, whether or not the, the demand is artificial, um, doesn't take away anything from the proof of concept that it's technically possible to do this.